I'm more concerned that they're doing everything they possibly can to try and get us in the war. Maybe doing is even something by September. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of the Black Swan Capitalist YouTube channel. I hope you're all doing well and in high spirits. Today, we have a very special guest, Martin Armstrong, a self-taught economic forecaster who offers a unique perspective on the underlying changes within the global economic and political environment. Martin, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Oh, it's always a pleasure. I think everybody has to we're all in this together. It's time everybody starts waking up a little bit to what's actually happening. Nicely said. And it's an absolute pleasure on my end as well. So I have watched a few of your recent interviews. And I have to say, I really did connect with you. You know, had to have you on the show because you offer such a unique perspective on some of the topics you were discussing, including the history of central banking, debt restructuring, CBDCs, and so much more. What I enjoyed the most, though, is that you explained the history behind what has transpired to help us get a better understanding of where this is all going. So let's start with today's financial and economic environment and just how this is all going to unfold moving forward. At the moment, we do have a failing monetary system and economic conditions, lots of propaganda being perpetuated through fake news while trying to take us to war and hide the fact that our economy is failing. And it seems to be their solution at the moment to create more debt and to inflate the system even further, resulting in further distortion of asset prices before either rolling out a new system or just to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. So what are your thoughts on that macro view over there? Well, what's actually taking place is that um, <clears throat> they understand that the system is collapsing. when. Um, President Reagan came to office, the national debt was $1 trillion. Today, the interest expenditures will exceed a trillion for the year. Um, we are still paying interest on World War II debt because they never pay anything off. Right. So you give Zelensky a trillion dollars today, guess what? It's going to cost you $3 trillion in, in a decade. Uh, it it there's no possible way to ever pay off the debt. And what people have to understand, what they're using the war for more than just a distraction. The, they're, um, you know, you, and you can see the propaganda. I mean, if you just did a little bit of research, go to a newspaper archive and just search the 2014 papers. Um, they go, oh, you know, Putin has invaded Ukraine. It was unprovoked. I mean, that's propaganda. First of all, what they did was they um, staged this revolution in 2014. Victoria Newland was there. They installed a uh, an interim government and then directed them to attack the Donbass. Now, that's all in the papers. This is all facts. It's not opinion. Uh, they call them terrorists. And you can just look at Zelensky when he ran. What was he promising? Peace. You know, the Ukrainian people did not want this war. And you've got nearly 10 million have had to flee. They've lost their homes. Uh, and it's got nothing to do with anything else. And I think the best example <clears throat> is you know, just look at Yugoslavia. When Yugoslavia broke up, it broke up according to ethnic lines, all right? The Donbass, you know, the Minsk agreement was that they were supposed to be uh, allowed to separate and have their own vote. And you also ended up with um, Merkel, Chancellor Merkel out of Germany, I don't know if she was, you know, drunk or what, but she actually <laughs> admitted to the press that they had no intention of honoring the Minsk agreement and it was basically to buy time for Ukraine just to build an army. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what's at stake here is <clears throat> they know they can't get out of the debt. And it's more of a, 
than just a distraction. It's, um, I mean, I've dealt with, you know, probably more central banks than anybody. And what's really going on here is they know that it's not sustainable going forward. So war is the perfect excuse to default on debt. Yep. You can look, basically, you can go on eBay and buy bonds from uh, all these older governments. You can even buy continental currency from the American Revolution. The The Constitution swore they were going to you know, pay the debts of the, of the previous government. They never did. That never happens. So <clears throat> from World War II, they never honored all the debts from before. So... <clears throat> If you create war, you get to default on everybody. You know, oh, that's the last government. We're a new one. <clears throat> so that's what basically takes place. <clears throat> now, you know, a lot of people are talking about the digital currency. And I don't think they quite understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, the digital currency is part of the solution for them. But there's a more sinister element to this that uh, I was talking to somebody and they apparently, you know, it's not in the major press, but um, United Nations has created their own digital currency. They are planning that that will replace the dollar uh, as a reserve currency. And why? <clears throat> Mainly because the um, sanctions that they put on Russia were uh, have actually destroyed the world economy. That's part of, you know, you, Russia pulls out, China pulls out, you start creating the bricks. All right. Uh, they set up their own clearing systems. When Russia went into Crimea in 2014, that's when Obama went to the SWIFT system and said, we want them to be removed. And SWIFT refused. They said, no, you're not going to use this monetary system as a weapon. So what did they do? They replaced the head of SWIFT in 2019, and he does whatever he's told. Uh, now, you have to understand, a lot of people, oh, this goes gold, the, the, and, the, and gold, and the dollar, etc. It's Look, that's all nonsense. This is geopolitical. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> you basically do not want to use the currency of your enemy. All right. So uh, effectively, that's what the UN is looking to reestablish the world economy. Um, and if, and saying, okay, fine, we will replace the dollar. All right. So you'll, you'll have that with the IMF. The, the United Nations has been using the climate change for to justify uh, no single country can possibly deal with this. It's going to take a coordinated effort by um, one major you know, overall government. So they've been pushing this one world government idea. And this has been around for a long time. You can look at our um, Google on our site. Holland, H-O-L-L. -L. Uh, he was the former, you know, president of France. And we have a video we put on there of him standing before the European Parliament with Merkel. And he explained the whole reason of the EU, one government for Europe will end European wars. Right. This is the same theory that the UN is pushing. So this war effort that they're pushing here, um, the UN plans to come out as the peacemaker mm -hmm. to justify, see, we're the ones that can bring peace to the world, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, you, you have their pandemic that they want to be able to control. Uh, you have the uh, IMF within it with, uh, you know, their coin to replace the dollar. Uh, so, I mean, this is a pretty coordinated effort, um, but right. it's that's really what's behind all this nonsense for war. And, and I can tell you that 
I mean, I was in Washington back then. You know, we met, you know, I can tell you with the neocons, when Reagan wanted to meet with Gorbachev, the neocons were against it. And they said, you can never trust the Russian. And they, they basically advised him against going. He didn't listen to him and went. If he did not do that, the Berlin Wall would still be up. Interesting. Um, so they have always been, I know some of these guys personally. Um, you can look at uh, Bill Crystal. He wrote the book on justifying going into Iraq. Um, Bill even spoke at one of our conferences back in the 90s. And so I know him and I argued with him. His theory was if you replaced all the dictators of the Middle East, Assad, you know, Gaddafi and, and Saddam Hussein, you'll bring peace to the Middle East. I said, this is absolute nonsense. You mm. can't do this with regime change. You got different cultures. Um, um, you know, you have, you know, Iran versus, you know, uh, Shiite versus Sunni. I mean, these are like, you know, Protestant versus Catholics you know, and Christianity. Right. You, these things are not solved easily, you know, and if they could ever be solved, um, right. they're always going to be there. <clears throat> you go to London and they still call Catholics papes, you know, <laughs> and, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about the civil war was in the 1600s. So these things last for a long, long time. Um <clears throat> I had met with the Yugoslav government before it broke up and they were like, Oh, you know, they, they killed 600 of us and put it, put us through us in a, in a, a common grave. And I thought I missed something on the news. I said, really? I said, when did this happen? Oh, you know, about, you know, 700 years ago. I said, Oh yes, that one. Okay. You know, um, the, the, the memories there are forever. So, right. um, they need this war mainly to elevate the UN, the IMF. Um, and when you do that, they get to default on all the other debts of the previous government. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, I was part of the vetting process for people who wanted to be president. They would send me in. Uh, I was to, you know, basically explain how the world economy functioned for real. And, but it was more or less, I would come back and they'd say, okay, fine. Do you think he's smart enough? Can he handle it? That's what it was before 99. And then I was asked, and I swear to God, I, you know, I was asked to go down and meet with Bush Jr. I said, all right, fine. Uh, but they said, well, this one's different. I said, what's different? And they actually said to me, I swear to God, this was the word. He's really stupid. I said, mm. what? Why would you make somebody stupid president? And they said, we just have to win. And he's got the name. Right. The Bush. After 99, you look at what's happened. Obama never attended 40% of his, his national security meetings. Now playing golf. They, you know, Biden is <clears throat> their perfect president. Um, <clears throat> I mean, most people don't understand what is the real role of the president. Mm -hmm. You have a cabinet meeting and the heads of all these different agencies are there. And they're like two-year-old children. Everybody, and the president is supposed to be the referee between these. Biden's not there cognitively or not even physically half the time. Um, so the problem you have, you have like the, the neocons are in full control of, of international policy. Uh, Blinken is the head of, of the State Department. And then he's running around threatening everybody with World War III, China, you know, um, et cetera. So, the problem is China is the largest holder of U.S. debt. So then Janet Yellen from Treasury has to hop on a plane, run over and say, please continue to buy our debt. And they look at her and basically say, so you want us to give you $100 billion, uh, so you can buy missiles to shoot us? 
you know, it, this is how chaotic it's become. Right. Uh, so there's nobody there acting as the referee. That's the real problem we have in Washington. And it's and nobody wants to talk about this, uh, but that's the real issue. And <clears throat> the neocons and these agencies, they've all, you know, wanted, you know, like a two-year-old child, they don't want to be told no. Um, they all want their own agenda. And that's what's led to absolute chaos in, in just about everything. Um, you know, you have the, uh, EPA outlawing gas stoves, you know, um, you know, um, ordering, uh, okay, fine, electric cars. And nobody really wants them. You know, um, my neighbor has uh, two Teslas and I joke, I said, well, you know, if a hurricane's coming, you know, I can put you, you know, your wife and, and your, your kid in my car, I can tie you to the roof. <laughs> you know, it's true. Uh, I said, just <laughs> keep your mouth open, you'll get plenty of bugs and that would be good protein for you, you know. <laughs> Right. Uh, it's, I mean, this is the chaos that you have. Um, you can't replace all cars with gas, you know, with electric. I mean, it's nonsense. They don't even, and, and then what, what would you do for all the electricity for the power grid? Yeah. And you know, you hear, I'm in Houston right now and uh, half the city still doesn't have power. Look, one, you know, you could, you could take the, um, when HBM bomb, I mean, you can take out the power grid. I mean, then what? Mm -hmm. You can't even go get food, nothing. I mean, it. Uh, even worse still, if you then go to a you know a complete digital currency, your entire savings could be wiped out. Um, Very good point. You Sorry. know, it's it, this is not security. You know, and unfortunately, you don't have anybody there with common sense saying, "Hey, look, I think we better look at this a little bit closer." Uh, mm -hmm. Rather than what makes the headlines, oh, everybody will think this is great, so we should do this today. You know, I mean, it's uh, uh, yeah. that's the, the chaos that's there. So, yes, the financial system is imploding. You can't continue. Um, if, if you take out the cost of all these wars that the neocons have done, the national debt would be at, at most a third of what it is today. Um, and if you actually paid it off, you know, um, people don't quite understand, but before um, <clears throat> basically uh, the fall of Bretton Woods, if you had a government bond in the in 1960s and you went down to the bank and you said, I want here, I got a hundred dollar E-bond. Will you lend me $50 against it? Hmm. Answer would be no. It was illegal to lend on government debt. So <clears throat> that is why the theory, it's less inflationary to, to borrow than to print. Because it was in theory taking money out of the system. Then after Brenton Woods fell, if you want to trade futures, you can post T-bills. Okay, all of a sudden... After 1971, the debt basically is collateral. So the problem you have, a lot of people like, you know, bashing the Federal Reserve. Oh, you know, they are they're barking up the wrong tree. I agree. Uh, the Fed is not the problem because <clears throat> the real debt is created by the Treasury and Congress. And that's just money that pays interest. All right. And then about often 70 up to 70% of that interest goes where? Offshore. China just sold 53 billion. They're starting to dump US debt. They have rebuilt a lot of the world economy from the interest that they've earned. You know, that doesn't stimulate the domestic economy. Um and all this nonsense is, you know, you have Biden standing up saying, oh, well, the money we're really giving to Ukraine is going to the industrial complex. They're just getting really the weapons. So it's creating jobs here. No, but you then create the debt. Who buys the debt? The foreigners. Right. So now you're exporting interest on it. I mean, 
you know, nobody's looking at any of this stuff closely at all. They're not paying attention to the right thing. They're not. And I think a lot of it is just, uh, and people don't really understand the economics of things. Uh, And um, it's, they still don't even teach the floating exchange rate system in school. They don't teach hedging, anything of this nature. So anybody that's like a hedge fund manager, all of us basically, you can't get a degree in that. You know, let's get real. I mean, when I was, um, uh, I was giving a lecture, I think it would a, It was at the market technicians or CompuTrack convention in Chicago. I don't remember which one. Uh, And Milton Friedman came to listen Mm -hmm. to me. And I was shocked. I was talking about currency, et cetera, and how the world was actually working. And he came up to me afterwards and he shook my hand. He says, that was the best speech I ever heard. And he says, you're doing what I just dreamed about. And I was like shocked. Like, you're Milton Friedman. What's going on? And we became friends. And then I realized in 1953, he wrote about, in theory, what would happen with a floating exchange rate system. And that's what he meant, that I was doing what he just dreamed about. Uh, He had written about it in 1953. It didn't come about till 1971. Um, But he saw it as a check and balance against governments. And to some degree, it is. We we argue over deficits and things of that nature, but we're not necessarily um, <clears throat> slamming them as hard, as hard as we really should. But, <clears throat> um, you know, very few people in the field um, of, of even formal economics or anything of that nature uh, have any experience in the real world. And, and that's mm-hmm. part of the problem. Um, you know, when I was called into the 19 you know, Brady Commission, the Presidential Commission, to study the 87 crash, uh, naturally they bring in an academic, they put him in there, and <clears throat> the first words out of his mouth was that we're going to go find the person that shorted this market and overpowered it and pushed it down. And I just simply said, do you realize that every investigation since 1907 began with those same words and nobody has ever been found? Uh, there right. is no such thing as this mythical short guy that sells it. And, you know, kind of offensive. But, you know, I said, you know, I'm not sure you understand how markets even function. I teach, <laughs> you know, finance. I said, that's very nice. You know, I have a little over $3 trillion under contract. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think I know what goes on. And um, yeah. it, I said, you know, you, you've never traded. What happens? Some, everybody's long. And then what, you know, some news happens, they try to sell and there's no bid. And the market will crash like a thousand points. And, you know, right. Oh, my God, what's happened? They go, oh, a heavy, th- you know, finger or something. No, it's, nobody's going to try and catch a, a falling knife. You wait till it hits the floor. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Then you pick it up. Um, that's right. That's the way markets are. Uh, when they come yeah. down, they come down hard and they come down fast. Bull markets are always longer drawn out affairs and bear markets are always short, sweet and to the point. A lot to unpack in what you discussed over there and very informative. So I really appreciate that detailed analysis. Today, when I look at our political class, for me, it's like watching House of Cards. You know, they're all corrupt. They're easily bought off, and we're left mm-hmm. without any genuine representation, in my opinion. What comes next is the best guess, a new kind of government. And I think that's where we are today. You mentioned something about the United Nations being behind a lot of this. And Vindel, my brother and I, we've speculated this for a very long time. You, you talked about a currency that they're putting together to replace the dollar's role. Based on our research, and this is extensive research from documents by the International Monetary Fund, by the Bank of International Settlements, and the World Bank, which the parent organization of the World Bank is the United Nations, interestingly, Mm -hmm. and various other institutions and discussions with various experts on and off record due to non-disclosure agreements. At this point, we've really confirmed to a degree that RippleNet, 
Ripple and their native digital asset called XRP is going to replace the world's reserve currency. So it can function very similar to the dollar's role as a global reserve currency settlement mechanism, which would allow countries, governments, financial institutions to settle transactions with uh, sovereignty for those nations uh, using XRP as a stable coin to trade outside the dollar, but still coexist with the dollar in other countries. Just given this context, you know, what are your thoughts on Ripple, the company, if you've ever heard of them, and the digital asset XRP? I think that um, there's not going to be any backing. Uh, if, if you back something, uh, then you're restraining the, the ability to create money. Mm -hmm. um, that's what Debt. brought Bretton Woods down. All right, you fixed the gold at thirty-five dollars, but you didn't limit the amount of dollars that you were printing. I, I think a three-year-old with a pocket calculator could figure out sooner or later it's going to go bust. All right, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what is happening here? And a, a lot of people have been, you know, talking about the crash for a long time. What they don't understand is. The level of debt is irrelevant. The question becomes, <clears throat> it's poli <clears throat> becomes political. Um, and this is the danger that I'm talking about when I, I say that China dumped $53 billion in the first quarter because you have Blinken running around threatening everybody. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're complete idiots. Governments fail historically. Um, and I'm talking going back centuries and centuries. Um, <clears throat> one of the first defaults go back to like the fourth century BC. Uh, they were city states were borrowing from the central bank effectively, which was uh, the temple of Apollo on, on the island of, of Delos. And they listed basically the 10 out of 13 city states that borrowed money from them, never paid. Um, <clears throat> so, what happens is when we're in these types of system where they're issuing new debt to pay off the old, it's a Ponzi scheme, all right? It can continue indefinitely as, as long as confidence is there, all right? As long as you are willing to still buy it because you know somebody else is going to buy it from you when you want to sell. However, with... Blinken and these neocons threatening World War III. Now you are disrupting those who are willing to buy. So China just dumped 53 billion first quarter. Question becomes, if they're no longer going to be buying, then who are you going to sell the debt to? All right, if you can't sell the debt, to pay off the old, that's when the default comes. All right. As long as you have buyers and you can keep rolling it down the road, everything's fine. But they are actually making decisions right now with these neocons threatening the world and all this kind of stuff. You are now limiting those that are willing to buy. So you've, you've, Divided the world economy, you got the BRICS versus, you know, the, the, the SWIFT system. Um, most likely, you're not going to be looking at any sort of a private uh, currency. Uh, you're talking about power. Right. All right. These people aren't willing uh, to surrender their sovereignty and their power. Uh, that's what creating the money is all about. All right, as long vote for me, and I'll give you this, that, and the other thing. That's what's bringing it down. It's communism collapsed uh, because it was inefficient. All right, uh, we are also inefficient. It's still the Marxist idea, and I got to see this actually firsthand because I was uh, one of the ones called in by China when they were to become capitalist mm -hmm. and they i flew over and met with the central bank um and they took me to this one facility that was surrounded by tanks they were downloading everything from the internet uh and it was very interesting 
and they Pretty took cool. me into a, into a room and they were tracking absolutely everything, but they were not interfering. They were studying. And uh, they had, <clears throat> I never knew there were that many, but they had 249 varieties of tea. And the questions were, why is this one tea selling for like $5 here and $10 over there? I said, well, where is it coming from? Well, here. I said, first you have transportation costs. Oh, yes. Okay. See, in communism, if it's a dollar here, it has to be a dollar everywhere, even if it costs you $10 to get it there. That's why it fell. All right. We are at this stage where politicians do not know how to run without promising, vote for me, I'll take it from this guy and give it to you. Mm -hmm. All right. When you start getting into that, all right, just look at what's going on in France. Uh, socialists come in, we're going to go after these rich people and really tear them apart. Guess what? They're leaving. All right. <clears throat> Same thing from Norway. Um, they don't get it, you know. <clears throat> People can leave, all right, and capital can be moved. The average worker can't hoard his, his labor. Somebody who is rich can refuse to invest. You know, so this is what brings down these types of things. Um, I would say that probably you're, you're looking at an unbacked currency, issued by the IMF. Um, mm -hmm. And the risk will be that they may go after um, forced uh, conversion of private, you know, digital currencies, cryptocurrencies or whatever. Um, right. Like an ESDR. Yeah. I mean, it's, you have to realize it, that uh, they have a pen. All right. And that with that pen, they can outlaw anything they want. Um, mm -hmm. You take, you know, um, I mean, I, <clears throat> I used to be in the gold business. I retired after 1980. Um, <clears throat> IRS had walked into me and they said, well, uh, we've decided you're a bank. I said, I'm a bank. Well, the Constitution never demonetized gold, so that's really money. Uh, we understand you didn't realize you were a bank. I said, no, I didn't realize. And then they say, well, okay, fine. You were supposed to report every transaction of $10,000 or more. And the fine is $50,000 per transaction. I looked at the guy. I said, what? You just want the keys? Is this what, what this is about? No, no, no. We understand you didn't know. Uh, we want to basically, we'll compromise, just let us come in and audit all the people that you that have been buying and selling. They audited yeah, over 3,000 right. clients. They can do that to a Bitcoin. Oh, you're a bank. You're, you're mining. It's just a, a question of, uh, of, of a pen. That's um, true. The state um, of New Jersey came in and said, no, 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 we, we declare you to be a merchant. Now, I'll, I'll tell you how nuts this was. In 1975, when gold was legalized, the state, <clears throat> Senator Wolferan came to me, asked me to write the law for the state of New Jersey, that gold would not mm. be taxable because once it started trading on the exchange, can't be subject to a sales tax. I said, okay, fine. I wrote the law. And it said, okay, gold is not... Con you know, subject to sales tax unless converted to use. Again, after 1980, state of New Jersey walks in. And what did they say to me? Oh, well, we've decided you're a merchant. I said, well, the IRS just said I'm a bank. All right. Uh, and they said, well, you should have been collecting sales tax. I said, no, I actually wrote the law. I took them to court and lost. All right. When I went, they, I was not even allowed to testify. The government said, we concede. He wrote the law. He may have misunderstood 
what the Senate asked them to actually write. Liquidity is the driver of all markets. And I think under the dollar's rule, liquidity is plunging, making borrowing and lending very difficult, which eventually will bring the economy to a halt. I'm going to send these documents to you when we're done with this call from the IMF and Trust Bridges talking about the digital asset, again, the XRP. They mm -hmm. said very clearly that XRP's on-demand liquidity solution could be the key to making governments whole and solving a debt crisis to mitigate a debt crisis. I found that to be very interesting because what we see happening in the digital asset space as well as the monetary system and then the geopolitical landscape, it seems like everything is converging into this one world government, if you will. I mean, pretty much, yeah. Right, pretty much, yeah. So, um, um, what please. will happen is this um, the United States in 1896 was virtually bankrupt. That's right. when JP Morgan had to lend 100 million in gold to bail out the treasury. Uh, it was World War I and World War II that made the United States the biggest economy. Britain was the biggest before. It lost that title after World War I. And um, that's really what made 1929 uh, all this. All right. So the, what will happen by starting the war over there in Europe, the capital will first come to the dollar. Yep. Uh, as it did with World War One, World War Two. All right. Uh, Europe is is um, it's a failed system. When they were creating the euro, they also came to me, and I warned them that. Um, they were saying, oh, everybody's going to pay one interest rate. Um, I said, what you're doing is, is just, it's propaganda. It's not going to work. Uh, I said, you have to consolidate the debts. Mm -hmm. And what it was, was coal out of Germany. Um, <clears throat> he refused to consolidate the debts of all members. Mainly because... <clears throat> He knew that the German people would never vote to join the euro. And you can look this up. He admitted he acted like a dictator. The Germans were never given a right to vote. He took them into the euro unilaterally. And what he did to do so, <clears throat> he refused to allow a consolidation of the debt. So, I warn them, and this is what is the fault <clears throat> in Europe. You just merely transferred the volatility from the currencies to the bond markets. You want to <clears throat> sell Italy and, and you want to do an arbitrage, uh, Italy versus Germany? What do you do? You sell the bonds and you buy the German. Right. All right. You used to do that with the currency. So the bonds have become the currency markets. That's it. Uh, and that's the problem with Europe. And you see the peripherals, the interest rates are higher than the core. Um, everything they promised about the euro is not, is not working. Mm -hmm. Then you have <clears throat> the credibility of the banking system. To be fair and equal, a bank has to have its reserves spread among all members can't prejudice Italy versus Spain, etc. All right. So then the banks are now vulnerable to the same problems of the volatility when you're looking at because they transferred it from the currency to the bonds. You get a default in, in Greece or Italy or Spain or whatever uh, that then ripples through and takes down banks in the north. It, it's really quite a mess. Uh, so <clears throat> they know these things. All right. This is why I honestly think that they are pushing for war as the excuse that they didn't fail. Uh, it's not that they designed the euro incorrectly. It's that, oh, it's Putin. Right. You know, Point you, the you finger at someone had, else. Uh, yeah, you already had Biden saying, oh, it's Putin's inflation. No, it's not. You know, but... 
um, they need an external enemy to blame so that they don't have to take the blame for what they've done. Yeah. It's like nine 11 all over again. Yeah, it, it is. It's, um, <clears throat> I think it was, uh, um, Brown university just came out and they did a study and, and found that, uh, the, uh, the war on terror, I think it was what, $3 trillion it's cost so far. Something uh, like that. Maybe more. It's, or it was a trillion. I don't remember, but yeah. the, the point is, and uh, I mean, I did, you know, speak with him. I said, you know, your number is very nice, but you're not calculating the interest. You know, good point. This is whatever you spend today, just double it in the next day, 10 years. I mean, um, you know, th this is why I said we're still paying interest on World War Two. I believe that makes sense. So they, they have to default. They, there yes. is no way out of this. Um, right. It's interesting. just a question I, of when. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, you know what's also interesting? I did see an article from the Wall Street Journal, and I don't trust that news outlet very much. I, I do my own research in this stuff, but this article was talking about how some blockchain technologies may mitigate a debt crisis. And again, I found that very interesting compared to what the document said from the IMF talking about Ripple and the XRP. So I've spoken with many different governments. All right. <clears throat> yeah. They basically think that 35% on average of the economy is not paying taxes. That's right. So eliminating physical money, regardless of what the digital currency is going to be, you know, one way or another, does that, that's irrelevant. But eliminating the physical money, they think you'll eliminate the underground economy and then they'll get more taxes. That's right. So that's what they're talking about uh, in helping to mitigate their debt crisis, but it won't because what they don't, they keep adding to it. Yeah. All right. So it's that's not, the CBDC, the central bank digital currency. Yeah. Right. And I can tell you that the Federal Reserve is not going to do it. What's actually going on is that all the top banks are, are creating their own. Why? Right. <clears throat> it's legal. If the Fed actually created the digital currency, they would need under the constitution a search warrant to look at your account. If the bank does it, there's already rules. The bank does it's It's like Facebook. All right. You have no first amendment right on Facebook. <laughs> they can do whatever no. they want. The first amendment says that the government shall not. Yeah. Okay. So the bank can do the same thing. The bank can, can look at your account and there are rules already in place. They have to provide suspicious activity reports. So if I put in $100,000 into your account, they go, oh, that's strange. And they will then immediately inform the government, I just did that. You should take a look at this. So that is already there. So by allowing the banks to do their digital currencies, all right. And you even have BlackRock trying to look at taking over, you know, Bitcoin. Yeah. We're um, going to talk about that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> they then can do whatever they need to do. And then they report to the feds, oh, you've done X, Y, Z. All right. The f that's perfectly legal. The fed didn't come and look at your account. They did. So there's no Fourth Amendment search warrant requirement, etc. It's the same thing with you know uh, censoring people with freedom of speech. The government can't, but everybody else can. So <clears throat> the the idea is that the banks would have their digital currencies. It will be regulated by the Federal Reserve, but the mm -hmm. Fed won't issue one. Because if the Fed issues it, then you got constitutional problems. This right. is the real scuttlebutt behind the behind the curtain. 
you make a very good point. And that's why the central banks are trying to get the commercial banks to adopt the CBDCs. Yes. So that way they can get away with it through the banks, the commercial banks, right? Yeah, and it's the perfect you know, scapegoat. You, you hire that 16-year-old girl next door to watch uh, the kids while you and your wife go out and you gave her 50 bucks. Oh, my God. She didn't pay yeah. taxes. And that's what's bringing down the whole country. You know, uh, But this is the way they think. My brother and I, we believe investing in the technology that is building these systems, acquiring a piece of the software, the blockchain mm -hmm. uh, is what we call it. That can make you incredibly wealthy as the wealth transfers from one set of assets to another. Because again, this is failing and money doesn't just disappear. It moves from one set of assets to another. And we believe commodities, including gold, which is the safest haven, in my opinion, and precious metals, tangible assets, and some of these protocols that are being implemented on the payment rails. And we've researched this thoroughly. We see one of the greatest wealth transfers in human history happening right now. We're like in the middle of it. And we just haven't had that crisis that can accelerate it just yet. And maybe a banking crisis or so forth could be it. Probably war first. Um, war first. They, um, they need war desperately. I agree. Uh, and... These people that we call the neocons, they are so close to, to grabbing that brass ring, all right? This is no point in history have they ever gained so much power. You know, um, <clears throat> you can look at McNamara. He did a thing on YouTube, uh, also wrote a book uh, that the whole Vietnam thing they lied about. Every single war, they have lied. You know, weapons of mass destruction, etc. cetera. Uh, McNamara came out and said the, the whole Vietnam thing, they thought Russia was involved. And at the end, he said, look, we were wrong. It was just a civil war. All right. Um, I've known a lot of these people. And all I can say is that their reasoning is seriously flawed. I think they're just, uh, quite honestly, I think they are, um, you know, communism fell. And I think they just got mad that they didn't get to shoot anybody. Uh, what else can you say? Um, <clears throat> that's, you know, like I said, what they told Reagan, oh, you never trust the Russian. So it goes from communists to, oh, they're just Russians now. Um, so I, they are so close to this ultimate goal of theirs that I don't, I'm more concerned that they're doing everything they possibly can to try and get us in the war. And that, that what they uh, may be doing is even something by like September. Um, right. For sure, the, between now and us, yeah. The, the, the gist of the way they look at it is that no president's ever lost uh, a war, uh, lost an election during period of war. That's the way they think. All right, so um, that's why they're pushing for Hillary. Because um, she would, you know, that's, you know, a lot of people don't even know about Benghazi. I mean, he was... You know, that was yeah. just an arms deal. They were funneling arms into, in, into Libya to, to, to get it to overthrow Gaddafi. And they were, they were sending arms into uh, Syria, you know, into uh, Syria for the same thing. Um, I know people that were in the, on the congressional investigation of, of that. I mean, you know, nobody wants to talk about the real truth about any of this stuff. But yeah. they have been waging wars since World War II, and they have not won a single one. Well, every um, war is a banker's war. It's it's them more than anything. And it's not really the banks that are instigating it. The banks are going along for the ride, yes. Uh, and the military, you know, industrial complex, of course. But uh, mm -hmm. these people are 
I mean, if it was just somebody on the street, they would be in jail for a hate crime. It's, it's just the way they are. And you have to understand that there's a psychological tactic that they mm -hmm. use. Um, you take Saddam Hussein. Oh, he's evil. He's this. But they try to get everybody to think he's absolute evil. And therefore, that justifies going into Iraq and killing millions of people. All right. Agreed. Because they're all evil. All right. <clears throat> they have done the same thing with Trump. You know, when he won, you had Hillary coming out. Anybody that voted for Trump, oh, they're a deplorable. Yeah. Uh, these kinds of comments, they're psychological war tactics uh, to get people to hate a whole nation of mm -hmm. people, etc. Yes. You know, you know the, the war thing, <clears throat> I think they're, that's their power. And I don't think they're going to back off um, and just lay down. I mean, of you not. can even Google, you'll, you'll, you'll find what they're, I can tell you what they're saying in, in Washington. They're telling them, everybody, that Putin is just bluffing. He would never push the button. They make yeah. it sound like, um, you know, the geopolitical analyst who lost his position is now with CNN. All right. And he got, he's the one that came up and said that we could defeat Russia in three days. Really? They, they make it sound as if you can go in, he'll never fire a shot, he'll fall to his knees and say, oh, please forgive me. You know, here, take my whole country. I mean, this is nonsense. It's complete nonsense. And they also try to pitch it that, that he's evil. Uh, yeah. And therefore... Uh, they'll get a ticker tape parade because they'll save the uh, the Russian people. Uh, I suggest looking at uh, Tony Blair's apology for Iraq. Exactly what he said. He said, yeah. we thought we were going in and saving the people. We subjected them to more sectarian violence than... I grew up in the Middle East. I was born and raised there in Saudi Arabia. And as a child growing up, watching my parents watch the news and Al Jazeera and the, the things that were going on when I was growing up, I remember that even the Palestinian president at the time was telling people that the CIA was trying to kill him. The CIA was trying to kill him. And at the same time, I do remember um, all, a lot of the hatred towards the Arab people. And this is something that you were just talking about trying to cultivate and nurture this learned stupidity throughout the mm -hmm. world to diminish the masses ability to critically think for themselves and to hate another group without understanding anything behind it. Um, I, I remember living through that at some point. And even when I moved to the USA, I was bullied a little bit because of my ethnicity, where I came from. Mm -hmm. But this is exactly what you're talking about. There is a, um, an agenda within maybe the world economic forum maybe some of the young global leaders this is a uni party within the military industrial complex and i think they're um, trying to divide and distract people while they try to buy time to create these fictional and baseless laws through an unelected uh, centralized power structure like the world economic forum or the g7 these are topics i would love to talk about i'm just not allowed to on youtube <laughs> on YouTube, they will ban. They will ban you. I promise. This happened to me in 2021 when I was talking about the the death sticks. Uh, that's why I call them. Anyways, they they call it global governance, and I I believe this is a euphemism for totalitarianism. Anyways, that's a whole different rabbit hole. Maybe one day we can talk about this, Martin. And I appreciate you allowing me to indulge myself in this conversation. But I do want to shift a little bit about Bitcoin. You said something that was fascinating in one of your interviews that you did, and you mentioned something. Uh, you, you mentioned that Bitcoin. You believed it was created by governments to pave the way for the acceptance of digital money. Mm -hmm. And just so you know, this is something we entirely agree with you on. 
we have done extensive research ourselves to support what you said there, including uncovering the 1996 white paper from the National Security Agency on yes. how to mint a digital currency. It's called SHA-256. Shortly after the 2008 financial crisis, they put a Band-Aid on it to bury the mess that we're now experiencing. And then Bitcoin emerged as a deception, in my opinion, to convince the masses that there was a way to fight the banks at their own game which is obviously not true. Can you explain how you came to the conclusion that Bitcoin was a government experiment? <clears throat> uh, two ways. One, the code for blockchain actually in the computing field programmers, um, we know it's raised back to the NSA. <laughs> um, but secondly, I've dealt with governments for 50 years and they are, they float a balloon. That's what we call them. Um, <clears throat> to see if it flies. All right. Bitcoin was out there marketed. Oh, this is the way it's going to replace the dollar. It's going to be the reserve currency. Uh, they can't shut it down. All this. Uh, it's, it's outside the central banks. I mean, this was all just absolute nonsense. All right. But it fits perfectly with the balloon strategy. All right. If the government came out with it, people would be suspicious. So what happens is they always have to, the fact that, oh, it's, it's going to be the anti-central bank currency. I mean, I even saw people saying it's going to replace the dollar as the reserve currency. You know, come on. Um, but <laughs> look, the fact that that was even being pushed was the cover up for basically for the whole, uh, government shipping this out. If you're really looking at, um, creating something that's really anti-government, why would you use blockchain so they can trace every little transaction? Uh, if I give you a hundred dollar bill, they don't know where I got it from. But if I give you a hundred Bitcoin, they know where I got it from and that guy and all the way down the line. That's not privacy. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, that is their ultimate goal. I mean, honestly, like I said, I've been in meetings. I've been warning them that, this is going to collapse. This system that they have created with perpetual debt is not going to be sustainable. Nobody's ever won in history once. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> this is their perfect excuse. I mean, this is the way to do it. And the way they look at it is that we are the enemy. We don't pay right. taxes. We, you know, uh, you found a hundred dollar bill in the, on the, in the parking lot. You didn't give them their 50%. Um, this is the way they look at it. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately there, as I say, there's no mirrors in, in Washington or Brussels. We are always the problem. So true. Um, that's why I was very suspicious about Bitcoin. I said, no, no. The, you're, you're putting out all this stuff to get people into it. Um, and, mm -hmm. oh, it's going to replace the dollar and the central. That's nonsense. All right. It's, it's complete nonsense. The only reason the dollar has been the reserve currency is, one, <clears throat> uh, economically, we have the largest consumer-based economy. That's right. All right. Because it's a consumer based economy, everybody from uh, Japan with their Toyotas and Germany with their BMWs, everybody wants to sell to Americans. That's how they yeah. rose up from the ashes. All right. Mm -hmm. China is <clears throat> copying the United States. Their Silk Road, they're trying to build a, a consumer based economy the rival the U S yeah. all right. Germany is 
still based on the 18th century mercantile model. We build things and sell them to everybody else and we take our profits home. You look at the studies, the average German has less net worth than an Italian. Yep. And their economy is in ruins. Well, they it's they keep their they don't even understand inflation, the hyperinflation of the 20s. They think it was, oh, because they printed money. No, it was not. All right. The printing of the money was the result of, not the cause. In December of 1922, the government confiscated 10% of everybody's accounts and handed them bonds because they couldn't make the reparation payments. The hyperinflation started in 1923. If the government came in and took 10% of all your, your money in the bank, would you leave the rest of it there? No. That's, oh. what, that's what started the hyperinflation. So the government, people moved money out of the country. They took every other currency but German. All right, so they ended up having to print money just to pay for the reparation payments. All right. That's very when interesting. It all collapsed, and they came out with a new currency in 1925. Look it up. What was it backed by? Real estate. How'd that go? It actually went fine because the people... It's, this is what you have to understand. And this is why we're in this, what they are calling everything bubble. Okay. Um, it's when you don't trust the government anymore, what do you do? Some people are buying gold. Some people are buying silver. Some people are buying art. Some people are buying rare coins, Ferraris, real estate, and stocks. So you've seen gold go up with the stock market not again right why because money has been fleeing the public sector going to the private sector if you don't trust government just as in germany people moved money when you move it away from the government that's what caused the hyperinflation it Very wasn't good the point. other way around yeah. And another thing, if I might add, because people don't trust the government and they haven't done their research, they're also running to Bitcoin. And that's a problem, too. You know, there's also a revolving door between Tether, the stable coin, Bitcoin and the U.S. bond market. I uh, mm -hmm. did a lot of research on this. I wrote papers about it. They use Tether to artificially produce fake liquidity, almost like a central bank, to buy up the Bitcoin and prop up. Uh, the U.S. bond market, and I actually wrote a, an article on this. I have to send it to you, and there are some links there as well. But they're buying up bonds uh, that other countries are dumping. So somebody is propping up the currency, and Tether is fueling the largest financial bubble in uh, the digital currency space. Yeah, I, I mean, that's very interesting. Uh, they're they're not doing anything different than anybody else has done in <laughs> over the yeah. centuries. That's right. Uh, it's always the same common scheme. Yep. Anyways, that's a very fascinating discussion. I know we, we kind of gone over an hour. If I can ask you one last question, we'll try to keep it short. I do want to ask you about the BRICS nations. I think they've made some interesting developments, de-dollarization. I think this is all geopolitical. Project Embridge, which is interestingly interoperable with the payment rails, again, being built by Ripple. That's another document I'll be sending you later on today. A lot of mainstream experts here in the US, they are trying to debunk the BRICS as a real threat. And many other experts that we have spoken to, they say it is a real threat. So my question is, is the BRICS nations a real threat? Should Americans be worried and concerned? Well, what it is, it is geopolitical. When they put the sanctions in on Russia, they have divided the world economy. All right. Um, and it's not a threat that, it, in the sense that it's going to replace the dollar type thing. 
it has divided the world economy and the uh, in that sense, we're not looking at um, globalization as we once did. So economic growth will continue to decline at least into 2028. Um, so it, it's more of a geopolitical issue where um, you have, a, you know, even India lining up more against the United States because they understand if you don't do what somebody like Blinken is, is directing you to do, they can remove you from the SWIFT system. Then what do you do? Right. That's what this is really about. It, it's not the dollarization because, oh, gee, the dollar is not backed by anything, so maybe they'll back by gold. That's all nonsense. This is geopolitical. You don't think it's inevitable that eventually we might end up maybe one day with a new reformed government and back on a gold standard using blockchain to tokenize assets, maybe a two-tier system, CBDCs for the closed for the masses, and then a one-tier system for those governments, institutions, maybe the one percenters backed by hard assets, something like that. Probably not. I mean, I think this, the government, um, our computer's basically projecting by 2032, you're looking at the collapse of, of um, our forms of government, which are Republicans. Uh, mm. re you know, and a Republic form of government is the most corrupt in history because all these people in Congress or whatever, or parliaments, they're subject to be bribed. Right. Um, simple as that. Uh, you can't bribe off. a dictator and you can't bribe a, a monarch, right? Um, hopefully, the next system comes, we're going to maybe go to more of a direct democracy. Um, an example, uh, just take the Vietnam War. 18, mm -hmm. you could be drafted. You were too young to have a drink and you weren't allowed to vote. But that's democracy. And then right. it sounds like bullshit. Yes. Look, we are we ever asked, do you want to go to war with Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran all simultaneously? Um, we are never asked these questions. Yet we're supposed to, oh, you live in a democracy. No, we do not. We live in a right. republic. All right. They make the decisions. If we don't show up for we're getting drafted or whatever. We go to jail. All right. So I think what you're talking about, uh, you don't get gradual re reform in that manner. It usually has to be uh, a crash and burn type situation. They will mm -hmm. not surrender power without uh, them being dragged out of office. Simple as that, historically. So what we're probably looking at is uh, a globalization of this realization. And last time it was the overthrow of monarchy. U.S. had a revolution. France said that's a good idea. Even Britain, you know, the parliament took the power away from the king. Um, this time uh, it's going to be against republics. So the question becomes, what do we end up with? Um, Klaus Schwab and those, that yeah. crew, they know, um, they, you know, his great reset is our 2032. All right. Yeah. Simple as that. I, I've known, you know, uh, <clears throat> the guys. There's hope. The movie. It, it could be stopped, possibly. I Unless don't think we wake it can be stopped up. because it's, it, it's, I mean, the crash and burn is going to come. But uh, his idea of total totalitarianism is not going to be acceptable. Um, of course. Uh, <clears throat> he will fail in that, re in that regard. Uh, but we're looking at the culmination of something that uh, occurs basically once every 300 years or so. And that's what we're really looking at. Uh, when, <clears throat> when Caesar crossed the Rubicon, all right, he wasn't a dictator. 
he was cheered by all the people. They opened their gates. He didn't have to fight his way to Rome. What happened? The Senate fled <clears throat> basically to, to, uh, to Asia. All right. Um, he forgave everybody and then he assassinated them. But it was a debt crisis. It was far worse than what we have in the sense that if you <clears throat> bought um, <clears throat> a house for $200,000 and the real estate went down, it's only worth maybe you know 50000 They still want the two hundred. They don't take the house back. That's not the issue. If you can't make up the two hundred, then they took your children and they sold them into slavery. A little bit different type of a debt crisis, right? Right. Um, but everybody cheered Caesar when he crossed the Rubicon because they were convinced that he was going to basically uh, wipe out all the debts. And he did. He set up a commission. So whatever you paid in interest throughout that period had to be accredited to the capital. Uh, so he False wiped liberty. out all the interest. He wiped out all the interest payments. So we're probably looking at something like that, more of a uh, a collapse of a republic uh, that they're just so corrupt. Um, like today, they would have to flee also because I don't think people are going to be down there defending uh, Congress or Parliament. Oh, um, no. And if I may state, this is also in the UN playbook to break the trust between governments and the people so that they can come oh, in yes. and bring in their new system. You know what I'm talking they about. They know that. They, they, like I said, this is all... They're counting on it. <clears throat> um, this is what they do. Like I say, floating balloons, etc demonizing somebody, uh, a country, whatever. This is how they get things done. It's incredible. It's all what part of psychological war. What a world we live in. Well, no, um, it's very, very true. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Martin. I truly appreciate this, and I hope we can talk again. It's been such a fascinating discussion, and you know, I truly appreciate your insights. You, you've got wealth of wisdom in you, and we need to pick your brain again here on the show. So do you have any uh, final thoughts for the audience or, you know, any piece of information, what they can no, do? Basically, to look, we're, we're all in this together. Uh, if you understand what's causing it, um, then we have a shot at correcting it um, in a positive manner. But yeah. it will come to a point where we have to correct it. I'm trying so hard to do my part. And we need everyone's support. Very small group oh, very of people. True. It's it's everywhere. I go to Europe, Asia, everybody. No matter what country you go to, everybody's complaining about their country, maybe for a different reason, but their politicians, everybody has the same problem. Yeah. Well, so. thanks again, Martin. Well, and I hope to have you. you on soon, okay? It was a pleasure. All right. Take care. <laughs>